So what they were saying before about these lights, how I can't see anybody in front of me, that's true. I can't see you, so uh, no throwing things at me. I'll miss it. I'll hit me or something. Uh, but um, uh, how many were here, how many, how many were in the other room yesterday to hear Angelina speak about the Delta Hospice? Angelina's right here. And so this is the kind of thing that we're facing in Canada. But, you know, you've got similar stuff coming to you in the U.S. So I'm going to be talking about what's happening in the U.S. and what you need to be concerned about. So that's what my talk is about. And I'm going to bring this down to this basic level of what it means to be human and why this affects you. Even though you're pro-life people, this issue affects you. And you can't, you can't say that it affects only these few. Like we make the mistake when we talk about how this issue affects vulnerable people because then it's somebody else. This issue affects us, every single one of us. I'm going to get into that. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, and I, I first should explain to you because some of you might be a little bit confused by this if you haven't heard uh, me speak before, if you don't know a lot about the issue. People talk about euthanasia and assisted suicide, and so let me explain to you what the difference is. So Canada in 2016 legalized euthanasia. The Netherlands and Belgium, they have euthanasia. Euthanasia is when I would lethally inject you. It's I kill you by lethal injection. You might have asked for it, but I killed you by lethal injection. Therefore, it's what? It's homicide. And the only thing honest about our Canadian law that legalized euthanasia is that they created an exception to homicide. So where do you find our euthanasia law in Canada? It's in the criminal code under homicide. And then you look down and there's an exception to homicide that a doctor can kill you by lethal injection if you're to request it, etc., etc. Assisted suicide is not much different than euthanasia. Assisted suicide, the doctor would write the lethal prescription for the same drugs... So it's not a difference of drugs. It's not a difference about the intention. The, the difference is how they do the act. They write a prescription for the same drugs, and you technically take the drugs yourself. So it would be put into your applesauce, and then you'd eat it up, or be put into your favorite drink, and you would drink it down. And so we can get into that if you want, but I don't think we should talk about these things too much because you get the idea. There's a difference between euthanasia and assisted suicide. They're birds of a feather that flock together. I'm going to say one other thing. When you have legalized assisted suicide, you'll see that, you'll, you'll see that the assisted suicide lobby is starting to change the language of these bills to allow for euthanasia, but also, even if, like in Oregon, where it says assisted suicide, and it seems the original law goes back to, you know, the 90s, so it's fairly, it's somewhat tight in its writing, it actually allows for euthanasia, and I'll get into that in a second. But we're sold this through a series of lies, okay? There's cultural lies, and I don't think there's anything new about that. You just heard Michael Voris speak, it's all about lies, the author of lies, if you want to say it that way. So we're taught, and I call these fatal flaws. And so we're told that this is all about freedom, choice, and autonomy. Where, where have you heard that before? Uh, have you ever heard that before? That's all about freedom, choice, and autonomy. Uh, this is not true. It's a lie. It's not about freedom. It's not about choice. And it's not about autonomy. We're told that these people are dying anyway. You know, so why would you even worry about it? If you don't want assisted suicide, you don't have to have assisted suicide, but somebody else wants assisted suicide. Why are you standing in the way? They're dying anyway. That's what you're going to be told. And in fact, many of them will have years to live. It's not about dying anyway. Uh, we're told that these laws have effective safeguards. I'm going to go through the laws a bit with you and explain to you that these laws are written in such a way that you can drive a hearse through it. They are so loosely written on purpose. The laws are written in such a way to do what? To expand over time. The laws are written in such a way so you can reinterpret the language. And it's not only in the U.S. where they did this. I'll give you a quick example just so you can put this one to breast. They will tell you there's no slippery slope. And they're going to say to you, well, look at the Netherlands. The Netherlands legalized euthanasia in 2002, and they've never changed their law. And that's true. They never changed the law, but the, the interpretation of the law has changed astronomically over time since 2002. So the language of the law was written in such a way to change in its interpretation over time. So it's become wider and wider and wider, not by changing it, but by changing the interpretation of what it means. We are told that people must make a clear request. Well, this is not always true. Not always true. Freedom, choice, and autonomy. Well, let's look at this. So 
what do the laws actually say is what's important to us. Because the problem with this issue is people debate the issue of assisted suicide based on philosophy, right? They'll say, well, you know, uh, my father suffered or my uncle suffered. I saw that death. I wouldn't want to die like that. Maybe assisted suicide might have some problems, but I wouldn't want to die like that. So they're thinking of the theory of assisted suicide and that they think we can control it. It'll be only for a few people. It's about ending suffering. It's all about a theory. And we have a hard time winning that battle in a secular society because it's all about the theory. But I always say, well, what does the law actually say? So in every jurisdiction, these laws are, are actually written. How they're written is to give the physician the right in law to be involved with causing her death. These are about the right of the physician and the protection of the physician. You look through the Oregon bill, you look through the Washington law, you look at the different bills in different states, what are they about? They're about the rules the doctor must follow in order to agree to be involved with causing her death. That's what the laws are about. They're not about protecting a vulnerable person. It's not about that at all. It has nothing to do with that. All those laws request have in it that you must request this, but we're going to get into that in a minute. Because, you know, this is the whole crux of it. They say it's about my choice, my freedom. I asked for it. What does it mean to be human, right? There's many reasons you might ask to die. I don't need to be a philosopher. To, to talk about this. We just need to be human, to understand the nature of the human person. And I believe there is a nature to the human person. Whether you believe in creation or not, we are wired in a certain way. Uh, we're not like my dog. When I get home, and I travel a lot, so my dog, who's a beautiful dog, will, will be missing me right now. She's probably sitting by the door as we speak, and she's waiting there thinking, how come he's not home yet? Anyway, and she's beautiful, and when I get home, she's going to wag her tail, she's going to cry, and she's going to really hope that I pet her, and then I take her for a walk. And then she'll be all happy, you see? She's simple. She's good, she's simple, she's loving, fine. Humans, we're more complicated. We're physical, we're psychological, we're social, we're emotional, we're spiritual, and we're one. Right? So the problem with this issue of assisted suicide and the problem with the issue of euthanasia in a secular sense is it negates the reality of the nature of the human person. Because it's normal for me when I'm going through a difficult time of my life, it's normal for me to be down, to become depressed, to become emotionally affected by that. It's normal for me to at times lose hope. Even if, a per, if I'm a person of great faith, it's normal for me at times to lose hope. It's normal for me to feel like a burden on others. It's normal for me to feel a loss of purpose in my life when I'm going through these difficulties. So when you're in that situation and you're feeling like there's no purpose for living and you might express, why am I still, he still here? Are you asking for someone to kill you? Or are you saying, I'm going through this human difficulty which is natural to the human person? The problem when we legalize this is when someone's at the lowest time of their life, that's when they are now being mixed in with this whole concept of being killed. Okay? So when I say this is not about vulnerable people, this issue is actually about all of us when we're at a vulnerable time of our life. Every single one of us. And it's not because we're terrible people, it's because we are human and we're fallen creatures. And if you don't believe in God, then it's because that's simply how we've evolved. Okay? That's how we are. This is a threat to all of us. How do we experience human suffering? Humans are physical. I've already gone through this. When we experience difficult symptoms, it's not, it not only affects us physically. When I'm going through physical illness, it's normal for me to be emotionally and psychologically affected by that. And vice versa. When someone's going through a psychologically difficult time, they often, it often shows in physical illness issues. And that's just normal. It's called being normal. Assisted suicide then threatens me. It threatens me at a vulnerable time of my life. And there are many reasons a person might ask to die. And the problem with this, they say, oh, well, we can control this. It'll be for the few. But how can you do that? Because that's unjust. To legalize assisted suicide for the few is unjust because there's many reasons humans suffer, right? It's unjust. And that's why these, these laws will naturally have to, have to legalize it. Once you cross the line of killing, it's normal for it to expand simply because it's called equality. So how, do the law, how does the law work? So I had a couple people hand out these pamphlets. If you didn't get one, they're on my table. It's a very simple pamphlet, sort of nice looking, called Shedding Light on Assisted Suicide in America. 
And I'm going to simplify things because obviously there's a little bit more to it, but actually there's not a lot more to it. A person must request a lethal prescription. That's the end of your involvement. That is your, your, your all autonomy in now, okay? <laughs> the doctor must determine if you qualify. A second doctor must ensure that the prognosis and decision for the assisted suicide is correct. So the second doctor in some of these laws doesn't even have to meet you. In some of these laws, all the second doctor is doing is assuring that the first doctor's prognosis was correct. So they would receive the medical records and they'd sign off and they'd say everything seems right. Right? It looks fine. So often the second doctor is simply an assisted suicide doctor who's willing to sign off on these reports. And if you know anything about other issues, you realize that that's not uncommon. The person or someone else must pick up the lethal prescription from the pharmacy. So when I say somebody else, maybe somebody else has been assigned to pick up the lethal prescription. At that point, there's no further oversight in the law. None of the U.S. laws have any oversight of the law. And, and I'll explain this to you. That means when the person dies by assisted suicide, there's no third party that's there, somebody who the government has hired to make sure the law was followed. There's nobody like that that's there. You might die alone or you might die with who? an assisted suicide volunteer by your side. Rarely is the doctor actually there. Once the person dies, the doctor who wrote the prescription must send in a report. So this is how the law works. It's supposed to be to protect you, but in fact there's no protection for you whatsoever in any of these laws. None of these laws provide oversight and protection. So let me explain it to you quickly again. What you get then, actually the next slide will give you some. I'm going to show you a little bit about this little clip. It comes home because this happened in Newfoundland, Canada. So you can hear that there's a bit of an accent. Don't hold it against them. They, they're just Newfoundlanders. And this happened in August of 2016. What's important about this is that euthanasia was legalized in Canada in June of 2016. So this is only a few months after legalization. And I think you should hear this story. It's a very powerful story. Oh, yeah, I got it. If I had to go ahead and do what the doctors wanted me to do, I wouldn't have had her. What was that? Well, they wanted me to do assisted suicide death on her. This is your story. <laughs> yeah. You said a couple of things on the CBC News story. Yeah. I remember they said, did you want to die? And what did you say? I don't want, I don't want to go. She got sick here at home. We got the ambulance. When we got her to the hospital, she was having seizures. Um, they had to give her medication to take her heart rate down. Her heart rate was quite a, very high, something 170. This doctor that was seeing her first, and he came in, he told me that her kidney wasn't in the right spot. He told me the lower parts of her lungs had collapsed, so he admitted her. And the next day, uh, when he came in, he took me out in the hallway and he just stood me up against the wall and he told me about assisted suicide death was legal in Canada, and I said, well, he asked, did I know? And I said, no. And then he said, uh, he was all for it. And I said, well, that was your choice. And I told him I wasn't interested in anything to do with assisted suicide death. And he told me, he said, uh, I was being selfish. And he wanted to assist me in doing this. And I said, I'm not interested. I more or less walked away from her. She heard everything, yeah. and Did you heard what the doctor said. Yeah. How did that make you feel? Not feeling good. Like not once did she ever say to them, "I want to end my life." Not once. You said they talked about it a lot. Did they talk about it a lot with you? Yeah. And this doctor came in, and next day after he told me about the assisted suicide death, and stuck his face down to hers and said, "Do you know how sick you are?" And I'm just like. And when I got his eyes contact, I went, well, I was like that to get out in the hallway. And I told him, I said, don't you ever pull something like that again. So at that time, were you worried that Candace was going to die? They had us come, told me that she was dying. I, I believed them. They were the doctors, and she was so sick. So but I told her if she wanted to go, it was cool. She could go. But she didn't. She don't feel me, honey. But she didn't want me to be alone. Don't cry. It's all done now. It's over. <laughs> we just don't want it to happen to anybody else, hey? No. Don't want another family to go through this. <laughs> yeah. 
So obviously the story here is that uh, no one's asking here for euthanasia-assisted suicide, but the doctor looks at Candace, who has multiple disabilities, who's clearly sick, there's no question about it. And remember, this, is, this filming was done about a year afterwards, so obviously Candace didn't die. Anyway, uh, the doctor's thinking that she should be dead by euthanasia, that this was a good option. You know, this is the idea of the physician. Now how often, we only know about this because Sheila Lewis got so upset she went to the media about it. Right? She complained to the hospital, and when she didn't get much of a response, she went to the media. How many of these type of stories happened that we didn't know anything about? How many people died by euthanasia or assisted suicide that we don't know the story because no one wants to talk about it? Are these choices about freedom? In all jurisdictions, these laws are designed to give the doctors willing to kill his or her patients the right and the power and the oversight of the law. It's a self-reporting system, so I already explained it. The doctor decides that you qualify. The same doctor can, you need a second doctor to agree. Uh, then that doctor can write you a lethal prescription. And after you're dead, the doctor gets to send in a report. And I say to you in a self-reporting system, so when I'm late for a talk and I've got to go somewhere to, for doing a talk and I'm, and I'm rushing down the highway at like 30 kilometers, I mean 20 miles over the speed limit, do I call the police to come pick me up? Do I self-report that I've broken the law? No, I don't. And of course, all these laws are designed so the physician self-reports. Let's see what uh, Dr. Toffler in Oregon has to say about it. My job as a doctor is to alleviate their suffering. It's not to be a vending machine when they make a good rational argument that they'd be better off dead. It's like being a lawyer for the defense and a lawyer for the prosecution in the same courtroom. Am I arguing for the health and well-being to extend life as long as is reasonable? Or am I advocating for their early demise because after all they're going to die anyhow? And then, by the way, if you don't think that's a conflict of interest, I'm also the judge to decide which argument's the best. And if you're not bothered by that, I'm also the executioner. There are about 200 doctors in the state of Oregon who believe they can keep all that conflict of interest straight. It's a delusion. If society is going to do this, if, if they believe that situational killing is the right answer for some illnesses, diseases, some points in life, then it should be someone outside of the house of medicine to avoid that inherent conflict of interest. Because after all, up until recently, there is no crystal ball reading course in medical school. And I say up until recently because for the first time in my university, in my department, some of my colleagues were teaching young doctors in training how they go about ending their patients' lives. So you see, it's very clear. Dr. Toffler hits the nail on the head. How do the laws work? They work by the doctor being the full decision maker. Uh, this is a conflict of interest. In fact, he does say, well, you know, non-doctors, like why have doctors do it? Uh, why have anybody do it, actually? This is the whole thing. Many assisted suicide uh, and euthanasia laws, uh, many of the assisted suicide laws permit euthanasia. So what happened is uh, that the assisted suicide lobby was always holding down the Oregon law. They controlled the Oregon law, and they were doing so on purpose because they wanted it to spread. And it took them, remember, uh, assisted suicide was first legalized in Oregon uh, in 1994, and then it was sort of held up by the courts, and they had that second plebiscite in 97, and then it came into being in 98. So it took from 98 to 2009 to get the second law passed. So there was the goal of the assisted suicide lobby to keep things sort of held down a little bit in Oregon because they wanted to spread, to metastasize, for the cancer to grow. And the only way to do that is to make it not look like it's going to grow exponentially on its own. But what happened is in the last couple of years, because they've won so many states now, they've got California too. That's a big state in the U.S. Think about this, what's going on in the U.S. with this. And I know it's a, a left-leaning state. I get it completely. Nonetheless, they've decided that the problem with the assisted suicide laws now, and this is the assisted suicide lobby, is that these laws are too tight. So the new bills are actually different than the old ones, but on top of it, they're starting to amend the old laws. So most assisted suicide laws state that the person must self-administer. So the word they use is self-administer. Now, I could get into a whole long debate about what that actually means. Nonetheless, it was somewhat clear that that would mean assisted suicide. The new assisted suicide bills do not require that the person self-administer, it says, but rather that the bills say may self-administer. Now, by adding the word may, you actually change the meaning of the law, okay? And I think we should understand that that's, that was very thoughtful of them to just add one word to get the change of meaning, okay? 
For instance, the New Hampshire assisted suicide bill, now we're not in New Hampshire, we're in Ohio, I get it. Uh, the New Hampshire assisted suicide bill actually was written different than the other ones, just to give you an example of how these bills are working, right? And so it talks about, the bill talks about writing the lethal prescription. So it's the rules all about writing the lethal prescription. But the bill then permits euthanasia because it gives the physician the right in law to write the lethal prescription, but it does not in any way, the bill does not in any way limit how those drugs can be used. So think about this. It's, it's different than the other bills because it totally ignores the whole issue of how the drug in the end is to be used. It doesn't say anything about self-administering. It says nothing about any of it because once you have the lethal drugs, then you can do anything you want with it. That means... You know, you could, if let's say someone would have a difficulty taking it themselves and somebody else would force it on them or to put it in their drip or whatever it might be, it wouldn't matter because the whole legal question was, did the doctor assess you right and was the writing of the prescription legal under the law? That's how the New Hampshire bill works, as an example. Uh, the Maryland bill is interesting because it uses the word may self-administer, but then it goes further because the Maryland bill actually requires a physician who's against assisted suicide to refer. So it says right in it that if a physician doesn't want to do it, they are required to refer, so therefore it's forcing pro-life physicians to be complicit in the act. And think about that. Um, uh, doctors at Nuremberg were tried, because, and, they, and there was, what was their defense? I was simply following the law. That was their defense. I was simply following the law. And here we have laws in, that are going through, and Canada's much worse than that, actually. And these doctors are being told, you must be complicit in the act. Okay? You must be complicit in the act. They say this is about terminal illness. Well, um, I don't know how much time I have. Jeanette Hall is still alive today. If you buy my video, Fatal Flaws, you'll see all these stories in it. Uh, I've got the, uh, and the Fatal Flaws film is only $30. Uh, it's fabulous. It's powerful. Uh, Jeanette Hall is one of the people in there. Jeanette Hall is still alive today. Why is Jeanette Hall alive today? Because her doctor, she was asking for assisted suicide. She qualified for assisted suicide, but her doctor didn't believe in assisted suicide. So what did he do? He found out what was important to Jeanette. And this is her picture of her with her son. Her son was in police, the police academy at the time, and he said to her, wouldn't you like to see your son graduate from the police academy? And she said, yes. So he was able to convince her by finding out what was important to her, he was able to convince her to accept medical treatment rather than assisted suicide, and she's still alive today, and she's happy to be alive. But the point of Jen Hall is, the point of Jen Hall, and you see it in the Fatal Flaws film, and all your friends would then see it when you're showing it to them, and all the people at your church will see it when you show it to them, that the doctor saying, I met her five years later after she got better. I was in a restaurant, and Jeanette Hall came up to me. She said, I was having dinner with my wife, and she was at the same restaurant. She comes up to me, and she says, I would be dead today if I had a different doctor. Right? A doctor who was pro-assisted suicide would have given her the drugs that she was asking for. She would have been dead with a different doctor. And that gives you the point of what this is all about. Most assisted suicide bills do not respect conscience rights. I went into that already. These bills require a doctor to oppose, who opposes assisted suicide to refer. Now, different, there's different levels of referral. Okay, so for instance, in my own province of Ontario, where I live, don't hold it against me. I, you know, I grew up there. That's where I am. You know, maybe I have to be a light in the darkness. But anyway, in the province of Ontario, a physician who does not believe in euthanasia or abortion has to do what they call an effective referral. So if a patient who is, has terminal illness or you know, is suffering and may qualify for euthanasia, if a doctor says, I, I, don't, I don't do that, I don't believe in that, I'm not going to be part of it, by the rules of the College of Physicians, they must send them to the euthanasia doctor. It's called an effective referral. That's how far it's gone in my own province of Ontario. And in British Columbia, you've got uh, over here the Delta Hospice people, and they're being told, as a hospice, they're saying, we're going to refuse to kill because we don't kill. We're running a hospice. We will not kill our patients. And the province is telling them, you will kill your patients or we will shut you down. That's what they're saying. That's how far it goes. The assisted suicide lobby has no intention of maintaining these safeguards in the bills. Let me go through this very quickly. The safeguards in the bills today that they're selling today in New York and Maryland and all these different places where these assisted suicide bills are, are for what reason? They are to, designed to sell assisted suicide to the legislators. 
They are to make sure that those Democrats and the odd maybe liberal Republican feels confident to vote in favor of it because they're not in fear of the possible problems. They're saying we have safeguards. That's what they're designed to do because the lobby doesn't have any intention of keeping these things. I'll go into that in a minute. So what else is happening you need to know about? Well, when we're fighting assisted suicide, the question is not only what the law says, it's how was it done? How is the act done? Well, the, currently, um, the assisted suicide lobby has been developing a cheaper way to kill. So the problem has been that the drugs to kill you by assisted suicide are too expensive. So therefore, the assisted suicide lobby started about five years ago trying to find new concoctions, new drug mixtures that will effectively kill you, but it'll be cheap because it's, it's hard to get convince people to you know, part with the money for death. You know? So the first drug cocktail that they came up with was too harsh. And they didn't stick with it too long. It, it was uh, only about a year and a bit, and they got rid of it because people were, had their throats and their mouths being burned, and they were screaming in pain as they were dying. Didn't go over with their death with dignity concept too well. You know, people screaming in pain. Imagine having your, your mother convinced that this is how she's supposed to die, and you're being the, the dutiful son sitting with her as she's screaming in pain because the drugs are burning her throat. Think about it. The second drug mixture they came up with is actually the third. The second drug mixture didn't last very long. That's why they refer to the DCMP was the second. DCMP2 was actually the third. Because DCMP wasn't a good killer, so they doubled it up and it became DCMP2. But the second drug mixture takes a long time to die, okay? So the longest time of death was 31 hours. You'll notice in the new assisted suicide bills, and I've been pointing this out to people, they've added something to it, is that the... Uh, the thing that you're supposed to acknowledge that it might take three hours to die or longer. And that wasn't in the old bills. And the reason is, is, of course, it takes so long to die with this new drug, okay? They're currently working on a new drug mixture again because they realize that the DCMP2 drug mixture, uh, long deaths, people don't go for that. They're, you know, you're sitting there for hours and hours and hours and hours. So last year in Oregon, I'm going to go through the data here. There it is. So in 2018, I don't have the 2019 data yet. In 2018, there was 168 reported assisted suicide deaths. Remember the word reported, okay? 169 people ingested the drugs. One person didn't die at all. So when they say in the stats that uh, the longest death took 31 hours, that's not true. One person didn't die at all in 2018 in Oregon. They just kept on living. They just, uh, he's not dying. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to say something that... Um, People might say it's crass, but it's true. Sometimes in order to speed it up, because remember, who's at the death? Sometimes family members, but often it's the assisted suicide volunteer, that they, there are people who volunteer to be with you as you're dying, right, to make sure it's done right. Sometimes they have to complete the act. Okay, think about it. Uh, 11 of the deaths, um, the lethal drugs were prescribed the year before. It's just data, right? That just meant they received the lethal drugs in, in 2017. Three of the patients were referred for a psychological evaluation. Now think of this. It's actually not three of 169. It's actually three out of 249. I'm going to get into that in one second. So you're telling me that only three people in the state of Oregon were going through psychological issues as they're going through terminal or life-threatening conditions asking for assisted suicide. You're telling me that only three were having psychological issues? I have a very hard time believing that. As a human being, okay, um, just think it through. Two physicians were referred in 2018 to the Oregon Medical Board. One of them actually lost their uh, license to prescribe any drugs at all in 2018. So this, uh, when they say there's nothing wrong going on in Oregon, how come in 2018 two physicians were referred to the Oregon Medical Board for not complying with the law in 2018? So uh, in 2018, one person died 807 days after receiving the lethal prescription. Now, it's supposed to be six months. So, you know, start doing the math, 807 days, not quite six months. Um, the ingestion status was unknown in 43. So what does this mean? So when you look at the Oregon data, it says that 43 people in 2018, the ingestion status was unknown. And they explain what this means. That means 43 of the people received the lethal drugs... And they died, but we don't know how they died. They have no idea. They don't know if they died a natural death. They don't know if they died by assisted suicide. They don't have a report. They just don't know how they died. Now, if you understand this further, the Oregon Health Authority makes it very clear they were given no financing or no authority to investigate. 
So when you look at the law, there's no authority for the Oregon Health Authority to actually investigate. They, all they do is, what do they do? They record keep. So when they receive a report, they know there's so many prescriptions written. All they're doing is record keeping and giving us information. That's all they are doing. They have no authority to investigate. So there might have been 43 more assisted suicides. It's possible. Maybe only 10 of those were assisted suicides. Maybe none of them were. We don't know what happened to 43 people. Now let's think this through. You're in the state of Ohio where 43 people died and all received a certain drug, and we have no idea what happened to them. There might be a concern. Might be a little concern. Okay? And we know we're going crazy over this uh, COVID virus or whatever you want to call it, COVID-19, whatever you want to call it. 43 deaths in Oregon, and they have no idea what happened. <laughs> Uh, with these cases. Think about it. Now, there was 249 lethal prescriptions written in 2018. So when they said there was three people sent for psychological evaluation, it's then three of 249, right? Think about this. And these laws are expanding now. So last year, the Oregon law removed the 15-day waiting period. You might not realize that. The reason that they said they did this was because some people who were asking for assisted suicide died before they could take the drug because there used to be a 15-day waiting period. So let's say I was nearing, nearing death and I'm asking for assisted suicide. Then they're saying, well, because of the 15-day waiting period, I was denied my right to die. Think about it. Because the 15-day waiting period was longer than my lifespan would be, right? So therefore, they're gonna, they wiped out that 15-day waiting period. Now, they said they wiped it out only in the circumstance where someone might have less than 15 days to live. But in fact, that means they wiped out the 15-day waiting period because the doctors are self-reporting and the whole thing. It's really wiping out the 15-day waiting period. Now, in January 2017, the Oregon Health Authority admitted that the six-month prognosis is not a six-month prognosis anyway. What it means is six months if you accept no medical treatment. Now, there's lots of medical conditions that people have who would be terminally ill within six months if they accept no medical treatment. What if you're a diabetic and you are insulin dependent? You would then qualify in Oregon for assisted suicide. Hawaii. Now, Hawaii is the best example you have now of a slippery slope in the U.S. because Hawaii legalized assisted suicide in 2018, and it came into effect on January 1st, 2019. There was 27 deaths by assisted suicide in Hawaii in 2019, so that's, that's very sad. But only 12 months later, one year later, there is two bills in the Hawaii legislature that they're debating to expand the law. 12 months, that's it. Think about it. Oh, there's no slippery slope. Oh, we're going to pass this law with safeguards, but 12 months later, we're going to change the law. Think about it. The proposed expansions include waiving the waiting period. Well, they did that in Oregon, so why not do that in Hawaii, right? Uh, waiving the counseling requirement. So Hawaii had a counseling requirement. They're going to waive that. Uh, proving assisted suicide by telehealth is one of the issues they're debating in Hawaii. Now think about this. I actually read an article about it. There's one section of Hawaii, one of the islands, where nobody can get assisted suicide because there's no doctor willing to do it. No doctor is willing to prescribe. So therefore, how do you get assisted suicide in that area of Hawaii and you've got no doctor willing to be doing, doing it? You can approve it by telehealth, right? You meet, you meet the doctor over the telehealth, the doctor writes a prescription, et cetera, et cetera. Requiring insurance companies to pay for it is one of the things they're debating. Now think about the little sisters of the poor, I don't know, requiring health insurance to have to pay for it. That would mean every health insurance would have to pay for assisted suicide, whether you believe in it or not. That's one of the things they're debating right now in Hawaii. A Washington state, which has had assisted suicide since 2009, uh, right now this year they're, they're uh, debating a study bill. I'm assuming the study bill will be approved because it's only a quote, quote, study bill. But what they're doing is they've got their friends at the University of Washington who are going to then examine 10 of the safeguards, and then they're gonna come back with a report this year and then next year, they get to amend their law, right? They'll say, well, you know, the people with white jackets who are educated at the University of Washington are telling us that we don't need those safeguards. One of the safeguards is assisted suicide itself. The one question is, should people, should we limit the law to having it self-administered, meaning you would, they, whether we should allow euthanasia in Washington State? Research indicates that there's 431 assisted deaths in the Netherlands in 2015 that were without requests. 431 in 2015, that's what the data shows. In 2013 in Belgium, there was over a thousand 
I'm not going to get into how they get that data. You can read my book or you can buy my stuff to find out about that. I'm happy to tell you more about it. Uh, these laws also use a self-reporting system. All of these laws employ a self-reporting system where the doctor who approves the death is the same doctor who prescribes the lethal drugs, who is the same doctor who sends in a report. These laws are designed for what? Protecting the doctor. Not you. They're not designed for you. They're not designed to protect you. They're designed to protect the doctor. Uh, Magritte, you're going to have to watch her on the film because I'm running out of time. But maybe I have more time than I thought. Hmm, what does it say? It says it's 3.12. We're not too bad. Anyway, um, uh, I'm going to show this clip. This is other the Netherlands. It's not the U.S. It's not Canada. But I think you're going to get the point of the importance of this clip. At the moment, they gave her the injection. They said they gave it so that she could go to sleep. But in fact, they just killed my mother. The GP said, well, I'm here with your mother and I ordered an ambulance because I think she has pneumonia. I drove to, uh, to the place where the hospital is and I got an, a call and there was a voicemail from a, a, a doctor from the ER. He said, you don't have to hurry because you will not find her alive if you come to the hospital. And he said, yeah, we had to, um, to give her an, uh, an injection, so she will uh, be in a coma, but it will be a coma, she will not wake up. My daughter was with me and, well, we drove to the hospital. So I said, but why? Why didn't you intubate her? And he said, I called the GP, and the GP said, she was lonely, she was depressed, she didn't want to go out of her house and, and she wanted to stay in her house, she didn't want to go to a home. Therefore we decided that it would be better not to uh, treat her anymore. They said my mother was depressed, but she was not depressed. The doctor called me in the middle of the night and said she had passed away. And I said the cause of death was the cause of death and she said pneumonia and heart failure. But I thought, I was laying in my bed, thought, no, that was not. It was that little injection you gave her. They say that self-determination is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. But in this case, was it self-determination? No, absolutely not. She was euthanized without consent. They decided. And how often does that happen? Well, of course, the laws aren't designed for us to know that. The laws are designed to protect the physician. So the Fatal Flaws film, which is right here, uh, we've sold actually quite a few thousand of these. It's been very successful. It's actually designed for the US market, in case you're wondering. The first film we put out a couple years ago was called The Euthanasia Deception. It was oriented towards the Canadian market. And then what happened is, is that uh, when uh, euthanasia law was passed in Canada, we decided, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take our second shot at this, and we're going to produce a film for the U.S. So this film is featuring interviews from the Netherlands and from the U.S. So we're comparing Oregon to the Netherlands. And the purpose of it is, is to wake up Americans to realize that you have assisted suicide in Oregon, but it's going to go to where the Netherlands is because you'll see that exactly the same thing is being discussed. It's, it's no, the difference is really how it's done, not what is being done, okay? The difference is in kind, not in reality. So this film is to wake up Americans. Uh, the stories, and I have a little pamphlet at my table, but I, I don't have that many with me, and the Fatal Flaws pamphlet with the, uh, with the major stories of the film in it. I also handed out this little uh, this article here, some of you have it, it's just explaining what's going on with the U.S. assisted suicide laws. They're changing. They're changing on purpose because the assisted suicide lobbies decided the laws were too tight. And therefore, now that they've had it in place in Oregon long enough, now they're expanding the laws. They've decided it's time to expand, okay? This is what you're faced with. I'm not going to show you the Fatal Flaws clip. So this is what's going on right now in the U.S. You get this big push for expansion, and a lot of people are still, still just sleeping as to what's going on. Uh, we've got big pushes right now in New York. New York's a big concern for us. I have another pamphlet I handed out to you guys, but I have one on the table called Caring Not Killing. And I have a, a little a card on my table that says on a Do Not Kill Me, um, it's if you, and you can sign it. Now the importance of that card is it wasn't my idea. 
the Do Not Kill Me card, the Do Not Kill Me card, wasn't my idea. It was a woman in Calgary, and she was 81 years old, and she was a supporter of ours. When they legalized euthanasia in Canada, she sent me this little letter with a picture of her arm, and she explained that she was always opposed to tattoos, and she had always told her, her children and her grandchildren that tattoos were a bad idea, they defaced the body, all the rest of it. But when they legalized euthanasia in Canada, she got a tattoo on her arm and it says, do not kill me, I oppose euthanasia and assisted suicide. So I got a card that says the same. And the funny thing was, I was speaking in Calgary, and Calgary is a good sized city. I was speaking in Calgary a couple years ago, and I had my card with me and I was telling the story. And she stands up and she says, yes, that's me. Now, she didn't show her tattoo or anything. But anyway, that's exactly the situation. I also have a little USB card here, and I'm trying to see where I lost it. But you'll see I have them on my table. The USB card has, and I also have my book, Exposing Vulnerable People with me, and I sell $20 for the book. I, hear, I have this USB card. Now, what's the USB card? So I stopped, I, I decided not to drag the book with me everywhere because I used to drag this book everywhere. You see Michael Forrest with all his books, you know, he's trying to sell them. He's got to drag them with him. So I thought I'd put the book on the USB. And then what's nice about it is all the links to articles and that are then live, which is nice. But also, I thought, well, then I can also load this up with what I think are the most important articles, most important research on euthanasia-assisted suicide that exists worldwide, the best articles, everything. So this is loaded down, and it's also, everything is separated by topic and everything, and I just charge 20 bucks for it. It's full of information. So if you, if you want to become an expert in the issue and don't want to spend 20 years to do it, uh, $20 will get you there if you're willing to read it. And I, we might actually have a tiny bit of time for questions. Yes, we do. There we go. Good job, good job. So I hope I was a little bit entertaining, at least when we're talking about death, because it's not a, not a nice topic. Oh, but thank you for taking your stand and all the research. It's good stuff. Well, five of the questions ask very similar things, so maybe you can kind of combine them together. But it has the whole idea of DNRs and living wills. Is there a phrase, is there a clause, how much legal help do we need? And to tie the fifth one in, is there any published living will or DNR that, that okay. is in keeping with the, the teachings of the church. Okay, so every, every uh, state is a little different. Uh, some of them are actually quite similar. I'm assuming in Ohio you have something called a will to live or something like that. Uh, someone put up their hand if they know about the, a document in Ohio like that. Because in Canada I sell what you call, I call it the life protecting power of attorney. And I have uh, one for different provinces. I have a general one because most of Canada is the same. But then there's British Columbia, which is actually different. I have one for British Columbia. And the idea, of course, is that here's the important thing. When you're talking about documents about who makes decisions for you if you become incompetent to make decisions for yourself, what's important about those documents is the language of them is everything. You can't go to your lawyer, even if he's a good Catholic lawyer, and it gives you this sort of, you know, health directive, you can't just sign it because the language of those documents are usually killer documents, okay? Uh, they're usually going to say something about, you know, accepting no treatment, only comfort care, things like that. And I'm not saying there isn't a time to accept comfort care. I'm not saying there isn't a time for that. But you want to have control over these decisions. So therefore, you need something like a, an Ohio will to live or something like that. If you're in Ohio, if you're in Michigan, there must be a document like that. I know in Michigan there is. Uh, I don't see any hands going up, so I don't know if there is a document like that. I'm assuming there is one in Ohio. Yes, there is. You need to get that document. Don't go to your lawyer and ask for the one that they pull up off their computers, because those documents will usually kill you. Okay. Uh, DNR orders should only be a do not resuscitate order. The problem is how they're interpreted. Now remember, these are different issues than euthanasia and assisted suicide, uh, because one is denying you basic care or medical treatment. Now, if I deny you basic care, such as food and fluids, when you're not dying, then that's morally equivalent to euthanasia. But legally, it's not seen the same way, even though it's morally equivalent. So we have to understand there's a difference between the moral question and the legal question around these issues. Uh, but nonetheless, um, the problem with do not resuscitate orders is not that sometimes they're not needed, because sometimes they are needed. Uh, the problem is how that's interpreted, because a lot of physicians today interpret that to mean no treatment at all. Right. Okay, kind of twofold. How do we find the organizations that are promoting them, and what are the benefits that they're trying to sell people on? Promoting what? Assisted suicide right. or promoting yeah. Uh, yeah. no treatment? Because yeah. I think no treatment's become the commonplace now. That in fact, what's happened is, is that uh, physicians today, the new physicians, are being taught 
to reject medical treatment in certain circumstances because they look at you differently than they did once. I say it's important to protect your friends. So in Canada, we started something called Compassionate Community Care. I have, um, so you'll notice the one pamphlet, I've got a 1-800 helpline on it. So people call us all the time dealing with this. But I tell you, if you're older or have significant health problems, don't go to the doctor alone. It's not because the doctor's an evil person. The doctor might be an evil person, but often isn't. It's because that doctor does not know you necessarily, and they look at you for what they see coming in the room. And if you have significant health problems, they might look at you as saying, I wouldn't want to live that way. But if you come in with a friend, and that person is your advocate, or that person is with you, you're seen as different, because now you're seen as part of a community. You're seen as having somebody with you. So I really say to a lot of people that the difficulty is if you're elderly, or if you've got significant health problems, you should not go to the doctor alone, because the doctor will look at you differently if you have somebody with you who cares about you. Great advice. Do you think the single-payer health care system in Canada and the desi what is desired by the left in this country has increased the financial pressure to encourage assisted suicide? Is it a system thing? Uh, partly. They, they'll never say that, but in fact, there's no coincidence that uh, they legalized euthanasia in Canada in June of 2016. And in December of 2016, in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, there was an article by these researchers saying how much money the Canadian healthcare system is going to save now that we legalize euthanasia. Now, their data that they put in that study was actually much lower than the reality because nobody anticipated how much death we would get in Canada. I'll just give it to you very quick. In 2014, when they were debating euthanasia, the Quebec Minister of Health, so that's just the province of Quebec, there's a lot of people in Quebec, said, well, I think there's probably going to be about 100 a year. 100 a year. Uh, last year in Canada, we had 5,000. We've had 13,000 since legalization. And it's, it's going up very fast. Okay, very, very fast. So obviously speaking, the numbers in that journal of Canadian um, Association uh, journal uh, saying how, many, how much money would be saved was a big underestimate because we've had a lot more death than that. Uh, how many people actually die by assisted suicide it really grows with the cultural acceptance of it, right? Yeah. Okay, I think that's it. I think we're going to give you a chance to get to your table, and we're going to let you folks know who didn't get a chance to uh, visit with Michael Voris. They're extending his book signing for the next 30 minutes after we are dismissed here today. In 30 minutes, right in here, we're going to have a special speaker address the issue of abortion and the targeted African-American communities. And right next door is going to be all the latest information and research on the Shroud of Turin. So you are dismissed right now. And uh, thank you again for Alex for this great research on thank a very, very difficult subject. Thank you. Both.